So what is a canon? Definitely uh, the word canon basically just means uh, measuring stick or simply list, something like that. So, but that is something that we have to realize with regards to the word canon. The term is, u is used variedly. There are a variety of concepts and approaches to the word. Our common understanding of it in the context of, uh, in our religious context, it is basically referring to a def definitive collection of literature. But it's still basically a list of books. So that's the understanding of a canon. It is definitely a list or a collection of books. In religion, it refers to texts regarded as authoritative for religious belief and practice, as well as for daily life. In some of the, your comments, I made a comment that you need to understand how to distinguish uh, basically a canonical book from a non-canonical book. So that basically should be understood in the context of religion. So when you have a canonical book, it is authoritative. That means it carries more authority for understanding religious belief and practice, as well as how to guide our daily life. That's why if you have a choice between a canonical and non-canonical, it is basically safer to uh, stick with the canonical. But that doesn't mean that uh, we, the non-canonical will no longer be helpful. It can still help us in a lot of ways. But as far as basis for Christian life and for daily life of a Christian, definitely we have to stick to the, what is considered canonical. So, but it doesn't stop us from using some other books that are in a way helpful. Like there are a lot of uh, spiritual reading books or spiritual books or books are regarding religion that are still helpful, even if they are not considered canonical. After all, they are based on the scriptures, so it's not a problem. Now, the canonization is a process. We have to understand that the canonization of these books did not happen at the beginning. It's not like that the it was not like that the Christian community at the beginning decided to say, okay, as we begin our community, we will have this kind of books. That was not the case. You have to realize that the writing of the books, the collection of these books came already several years after the community has been established. Especially because many of these things were products of what has been shared and related and, and transmitted orally. They were only put into writing at some points. That's why you can understand that, that it didn't exist at the beginning of these different communities, like with the, with the Jewish early Jewish communities, or as early as the time of, let's say, of Abraham and the like. So there were not, not much scripture. And like, for example, in the New Testament, the Christians, they already have the Old Testament as their scriptures. And then, of course, for us in our context today, we have both the Old Testament and the New Testament. So basically, in terms of process, we have to understand that these many books became basically canonical through this process that went through so much uh, period up to the 15th or 16th century. So that's why there were, there were, questions, you know, there were questions that were raised regarding uh, about the criteria and how it happened that they chose these books and not the other one and so on, why they preferred these books and they did not prefer those other books and so on. So this process would actually help us understand how things happen. So as I've said, it was not planned from the beginning. It just basically came about in terms of in the development of the communities. So the first is that we have to realize that this process, this canonical, this choosing of these books actually emerges in a social context. So that means in the community, they are used to having public readings or communal study, and they would choose materials. At that time, there was no idea, not everyone will have the same idea which books would they prioritize. They just basically took advantage of what was available at that time 
and then the more that they use them the more that they realize that some books are better and the others are not some books are helpful the others are not and then some books are more or less in line with the basic tenets of the faith and the others are are questionable in some of its uh, expressions and so on that's why there alone people already started choosing which books they would have in the same way that in our in our life for example if you are used to reading books there are books that eventually becomes your favorite because as you read it you like it and you enjoy it but there are books that uh, after reading or even i just after reading a few pages you would always say i don't like it so in the in the context of uh, society or the community that has been basically the case so the community was the one who decided to keep some of the books and to let go of some other books that's why many of those books that they kept eventually became a part of uh, the collection that they have and when they shared it with other churches and communities they just realized that uh, maybe the the choices were uh, si similar in many respects that's why when someone asked basically what what is meant by wider uh, ecclesiastical usage that's basically the case when a particular book is present in the list of many of the of the churches then definitely that is a wide usage of that and then of course the second one is there were historical events that became the context for their decisions in terms of choosing which books they would consider uh, uh, authoritative and which ones are not so we're talking about conflicts like physical conflicts and ideological conflicts so physical conflicts when there are of course wars and political and so on and then you have ideological when they have when they part ways because they have different understanding they have different understanding of the truth and so on also demographic and geographic shifts that means people have been changing in terms of their development and their exposures and they are shifting also from one place to the other this would actually eventually affect the canonizing of many of the books that we have. Like, for example, why did the uh, why did the uh, books in the Old Testament became longer? Because some books that were originally written in Greek became part of the what was translated from the Hebrew. That's why you have longer longer list of books now compared to what was used by the Jews in the beginning. So that. That is because the Jews in the diaspora, the Jews that were basically dispersed in many other places, and they were already living in Greek-speaking context, they needed to come up with a, a translation of the Hebrew Bible. And yet at the same time, they, they were able to discover some original text in the, in the Greek language that they eventually uh, considered as part of their collection. That's why that, that also that helps and contributes to the uh, collecting of these different materials. Then the role of technology is also something that we need to consider. Technology in terms of how they improved collecting these materials. You have to realize that in the beginning, they were using the scrolls. And the scrolls at the time were definitely bulky and it's big. Imagine if you, for example, complete a whole library of these books and all of them were written in scrolls. You can just imagine what kind of library you will have. It's almost like probably a storage area where you have big scrolls and scrolls of materials. So when they were able to discover the codex, if you remember what a codex is, it looks like uh, a book already where, where many of these books were put together in one, in one collection like a codex then it was easier for them to collect the books that they have. That's why many of the ancient codices that we have, like Sinaiticus, Alexandrinos, and Vaticanus, when you look at them, their collection of the New Testament is almost complete, plus other books that we find in the New Testament Apocrypha or the, the words of the Church Fathers and so on. Like, for example, uh, the Didache, the Letter of Barnabas, and things like that were included in this uh, collection of codices. So that means if, if you put together many of these books in one in one compilation like a book, definitely 
that is already like an indication that this collection will be part of your canon. But that was basically at the beginning until eventually the church came up with uh, many of these things. So it helps eventually in the colonization process when you are able to put together the kind of books that you will consider as helpful. So as a result, they make a distinction between scriptures and the Bible. So normally, normally the scriptures would refer to the collection that they consider authoritative. And the Bible is the one, the, the compilation, the, the putting together, the codex that eventually uh, put them together. So that's why here the scriptures would be the group of texts considered canonical or authoritative. And then the Bible would refer to the collection in codex form. That means in book form already. So that's generally what is understood then at the time. But eventually, these two terms have been used ex interchangeably to refer to the same reality. So that's generally the, the, the process that it went through in terms of canonization. So it came out of the context of the community using these materials. And then, of course, there were, there were uh, conflicts and shifts and movements and so on in the history that eventually led to the that that somehow contributed to the deciding what books they would prefer and which books they will disregard and so on now let's look at the canonization of the jewish scripture or the christian old testament because these are the the whole process is different from the way the canonization process of the new testament went so we will have to make that distinction. Now, evidence for a Jewish scriptures canon in the second temple period is not easy to find. When, we, when you hear the word second temple period, it's basically the period close to the New Testament times. Because the, this was the time when, after, when they returned from exile in Babylon, they returned to Judea and they rebuilt the temple. That temple is called the second temple because the first one was the one that was built by Solomon at the beginning of the, of the uh, what you call this, Israelite empire or kingdom. So in the second temple period, is basically temple, the period after, after the exile, which basically started what we now call as Judaism or the Jews, because before that they were called Israelites, but now they're Jews because of the fact that they are in Judea and their religion is called Judaism. And of course, Jesus came at that point when uh, Judaism was already the religion. And of course, the developments has already, they were already called Jews at that time. So even Jesus was uh, a Jew. So authoritative writings for those living in Judea was already evolved depending on the era, whether it was a Persian period, the Roman period, and so on. So it somehow affected the writings. It also basically uh, contributed in determining what would be authoritative or not. Like the writings that were found in the temple archives, normally they, they, that's where they keep the writings, where they protect them in the temple treasury. That also helped more or less determine what, what, which books in the Old Testament were considered important for that's why they were saying that whatever book they found in the temple archives, they considered them as part of the collection. So because at least that's the easiest way to think about it. It would be uh, hidden in the church, in the temple, or in the church building and so on, in the library of that church, where they could see basically what the community has gathered together and collected as part of their authoritative writings. Now, literature outside of Judea, that means outside of uh, Palestine area, challenged this claim to authority. Because they're saying that the, only the, the books that are in, found in the temple are the ones considered authoritative. But the Jews outside of it would not actually accept it. Because we know that Judaism at that time eventually uh, was uh, dispersed into so many places. So uh, this, this whole, uh, what do you call this, uh, uh, process, uh, we could probably think of three, three factors that uh, affected or that contributed to this. So one is the national disintegration. 
that means the first temple destruction was the first temple was destroyed they were uh, exiled and then of course they returned to Judea and then the Maccabean revolt happened and then the Roman wars so all of this affected basically the profile of the community so uh, you're talking about different kinds of communities already then because of this the center was not just basically the temple because in the olden times the temple was the center that's where basically everything religious was kept about faith and then the, even the scribes temple-based scribes were there they were the ones who had it. but after this integration there were actually non-temple-based uh, scribes that emerged so they also wrote but they were not basically honed and trained within the temple themselves so another thing that contributed was the controversies among different jewish groups you know you realize that there was not just one kind or strand of judaism because that was something that was uh, uh peculiar to the first century we're not just talking about one strand of judaism Although the dominant one, what they refer to as rabbinic Judaism, uh, where they have rabbis and so on, this one were the uh, were the dominant one at the time, with the Sadducees and the Pharisees and so on. So, but aside from that, and that's basically the contribution of, of the Dead Sea Scrolls, because someone was asking that question. That basically was the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls gave us an idea that at that time in the first in the first uh, century there were not only uh, rabbinic judaism or rabbinic jews at that time not only the zealots who were who were very uh, what do you call this uh, who were who were rebellious and you were the ones fighting more or less politically the powers that be at that time but they were also discovered that the that the collection that was found in the dead sea were actually scrolls that were what was owned by a strand of judaism which was which is now uh, uh what do you call this which is now uh, referred to as the Essenes. so that's another group of judaism so they have these different uh groups of uh, jewish jewish groups that eventually also affected the choosing of these different books that were considered as authoritative for these different countries so because of the exile and the diaspora, the focus of the Jewish identity was no longer from national, but to a religious identity. Before, when they were kingdom of Israel, so the identity of the nation as well as the individuals were and the, and the religious, the religion of the people were practically the same. But because there is no longer the, the national image of, or figure of the community, like the Israelite kingdom, that was no longer there, but it has transferred to a religious identity like Judaism. So that was basically what happened after, after the Torah. So it enabled the Jews outside of Judea to produce literature as well, portraying Jews as living covenant and life apart from the legal requirements of the Judean state. So books like Esther, Tobit, like Third Book of Maccabees, etc., are part of this collection. And I'm sure the one that we refer to as deuterocanonical in the Catholic Bibles are also included in these writings or literature that were produced outside of, uh, of Judea. So that became basically uh, included as well in the, in the list that we have. So alternative understanding of Jewish identity inspired Jews to regard different writings as authoritative for their own communities. Again, the Qumran community, which are Essenes, would have their own collection also of writings. That's why the Dead Sea Scrolls indicated to us basically what kind of writings the Qumran community or the Essenes were keeping in their in their in their uh, treasury and things like that. So that is uh, another another kind of a list that is different from what is regarded as authoritative by the Rabbinic, rabbinic Jews at that time. So in the second temple period, there are two versions of Holy Scriptures that were basically considered important for people. So the first one is the Old or old Greek or Septuagint. So this consists of books categorized by the grandson of Ben Sira, 
which you can find in the introduction to the book of Sirah, that it mentions about the law, the prophets, and other books of our ancestors. So that's the listing of the books that they have. And they already categorized them into three, the law, the prophets, and the, book of, the books of our ancestors. This is basically equivalent to what we basically are considered as the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketubim. So known not only to diaspora Jews, but also in Qumran. So they have basically sh they shared this collection of books. They include the deuterocanonical books that we have, that, we, that one that we consider in the Catholic, uh, Catholic canon, like Wisdom of Solomon, Book of Sirach, the Letter of Jeremiah, Daniel, Daniel and Esther, Tobit, Judith, 1, 2, 3, 4 Maccabees, Psalm 151, and 1 Esdras. So these are generally uh, what is considered as deuterocanonical books. But some of them uh, would have been different forms already in the text that we have. Then the other one is the Hebrew scripture, attested in rabbinic literature and in Josephus. So Josephus is a first century Jewish historian. In his, in his writings, he mentioned in, in his, uh, in his uh, book on against Apion, he mentioned 22 holy books corresponding to the number of letters of the Hebrew alphabet. So this refers to them as holy, the, the, when they refer to them as holy, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is already a closed canon, that they only have those 22 books in their collection. The additional phrase, no one has ventured either, either to add or to remove or to alter a syllable, was intended more to suggest the re reliability of the Jewish history rather than that of the Greeks. So you see, these are generally the, the textual tradition that we have. So the old Greek, which is basically represented by the Septuagint, and definitely has a longer list because of these additions, and also the Hebrew scripture, which is basically counted only as 24, but when they were adopted by the Christians, by the Protestants, they were the count was already 39. And here, Josephus, who is a first century historian, mentions only 22 in his list. But more or less, these are generally the sources of the Old Testament that we have. So Josephus did not list these 22 books. So that's, he did not identify them. That's why it is difficult to determine whether his list was identical to the 24-book canon later adopted in rabbinic circles, as well as by the Masoretic scholars of Tiberius in Galilee in the Middle Ages, which is referred to as the Masoretic text. So that's the problem with this uh, uh, evidence from Josephus. He mentioned about the 22 books, but he did not name them. So it could be any other books. So we are not sure whether these 22 books that he has is already the same books that is considered in the 24 book canon that was already referred to as the Masoretic text. Okay, so based on uh, Jamnia and other rabbinic accounts, some, some scholars argue that this collection did not include Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, or Esther, which are basically part of uh, what we find in the, in the Deuterocanonical listings or in the, in the Septuagint, and that these were added to the rabbinic canonical collection at the end of the second or the beginning of the third century. But Josephus thinks otherwise by alluding to material contained in Ecclesiastes. So that means Josephus in his, in his writing may have included actually Ecclesiastes because he alluded to it, attributing 1,005 oaths and songs as well as 3,000 parables and similitudes to Solomon, as well as the Esther story in his historical summary. So it's possible that in the 22 books of Josephus, he would be mentioning also Ecclesiastes and the book of Esther. But we do not know that for sure because he did not precisely enumerate the list that he is in, that the, the books that are included in the 22 books that he mentioned in that writing. So in terms of theories, there are actually uh, these two dominant theories regarding the dating and formation of the Jewish scriptural canon, scholar, uh, scriptural canon, sorry. And then of course there are challenges to these uh, theories as well. The earliest one is the three-part type canon, 
basically meaning that the canon happened uh, or was cut, the books were canonized according to the three different categories that we mentioned earlier the Torah, the Nebiim, and the Ketubim. So, the, basically, the law, the prophets, and the other writings. And then, of course, there are some scholars suggested some revised uh, idea regarding this tri triple canon theory that we're talking about. So what is this tripartite canon? So this is basically accepted among 19th to early 20th century scholars. Though, so they said that the canon of the Old Testament developed in three stages, corresponding to the three divisions in current Jewish Bibles, the Tanakh, which is basically the T representing the Torah, then the N representing the Nevi'im, and the K representing the Ketuvi, which is basically the, the law, the prophets, and the writings. So the Pentateuch basically is what is the is the term that we use to refer to the Torah or to the to the law. So they were basically accepted already as a group around the year 400 BC. So that means they were already accepted as one collection, one set of collections. The Pentateuch, or the or the Torah, or the Law. Then the prophets came second, around 200 BCE, and then the other books of our ancestors or writings came last. So, even among Jews, Christians, and of course the Orthodox Christians and Protestant and other Christians for that matter, they disagree in some of the books that we have. But basically, when it comes to the Pentateuch, all are are accepting the first five books as part of the collection and then most of the prophetic books are also considered but when it comes to the writings that's where they differ because uh the number of books considered by the greek by the hebrews i mean by the jews would be different from that of course the the protestant followed the jews in that listing but the catholics and the orthodox christians basically deviated from it because they accepted basically what we refer to as deuterocanonical books. That's why we have longer lists compared to the list of the canonical books in the Hebrew scripture, as well as in what is considered by the Protestants as canonical, especially for them. So according to this theory, the final collection was accepted no later than the rabbinical gathering held in a place called Yavne or Jamnia around 90 CE. So that's already 90 CE. So it's already in the first century. Now, there is also variations in terms of the, the closure of this collection. So like Friedman, uh, a scholar, uh, prefers basically to say that the closure of this collection happened in the Persian period. The Persian period was still basically at the time when they were Return, when they were allowed to return to Judea from the from the exile, so that was basically what he was thinking. That around that time, the collection was already like a closed collection. By while Lehman and Beckwith would say that it was in the Maccabean period. That means at the time when when Palestine was already being ruled by the Greeks. So like uh, uh, that's basically the time. So that that even if uh, the scholars are not in agreement with regards to some of these details. Then, anyway, the canons that we have is actually uh, help us to explain how Christians included the Apocrypha in their first or Old Testament. You might be wondering why I'm putting first slash Old Testament here, because we already mentioned that earlier, that some people would prefer to use the word first rather than the Old. Well, the Jews would not like their their books to be considered old. That's why they would like to use first. While the Christians would prefer to use the uh, word old to the collection in the Old Testament because we have a new collection which we now refer to as the New Testament. But anyway, uh, this this cannot this cannot this theory would help us understand definitely why why the list of books that is considered canonical for for the Jews and for the Protestant Christians is is definitely different from our listing in the Catholic Church as well as in the Orthodox Christians. Because among the, the Catholic and the Orthodox Christians have definitely longer number of books. More, they have more books compared to what is considered canonical by the Jews as well as by the Protestants. 
So here, scholars would propose two canons. That means two lists. Palestinian canon, which is a narrower canon, which is basically represented by the Hebrew Bible, or what is uh, what the Protestants would consider as their own basis for their listing. The other one is the Alexandrian canon. Alexandria being in, uh, in Egypt is considered where the Septuagint came from. I mean, the translation into the, the Hebrew Bible into uh, Greek, Greek was what happened basically. So it's a broader, it's a longer list. That's why uh, it's, it's, a, it's considered as another tradition in terms of, of the canon. So basically the Hebrew, the, the Jews would follow the narrower canon, which is the Palestinian canon, while the Catholics and the Orthodox is following basically the Alexandrian canon, which is a longer list because of the addition of what we consider the deuterocanonical books uh, in, the, in the Old Testament. So this is attested, as I mentioned, by the Sarkozyn Codices, the longer list, the, the Alexandrian canon which group books differently than the Hebrew Bible. We saw basically uh, when we went, went to an overview of the Bibles, uh, of the books that is contained in the Bible of the Old Testament and the New Testament, we see basically how, what, what, what are the contents and how they are uh, categorizing them. So, of course, this uh, <coughs> theory is discredited by the fact that many groupings in early Christian canon lists they diverge from that of the Septuagint codices. So it is not also true that, uh, I mean, you know, there is no uh, certainty with the claim that uh, Septuagint codices were the only basis for, for the listings that is used in the, Christian, in the Christian context. So this demonstrates to us that Christians had not inherited a canon for ordering or a listing, let alone a tripartite one for the Second Temple period Judaism. So that means, with regards to our Old Testament, it is not certain, and there is no evidence that would prove that indeed our listing is an offshoot of, of that tripartite canon that is basically derived from the Second Temple Judaism at the time. Other observations that challenge the tripartite theory, and this is the most important, I think, observation, is that upon the re-examination of the type of meeting that happened in Yavne, in that rabbinical gathering in the year 90, they were able to discover that the, the later rabbinic texts attest to the ongoing debate over which books were to be included in the canon, but the decision at Yavne or Jamnia could not have been either binding or universal at the time. So that means it was not like a, a central government that will decide which, which list will actually be binding to all kinds of Jews. So the assumption that the third collection, the writings, was created in view of the inclusion of texts produced during the second century BCE has also been abandoned. Saying except, except for Daniel, these texts are firmly dated prior to the Maccabean period. That means all the books that are included in the Old Testament are practically uh, known to have been written before the Maccabean period. So it's, it's basically not considered to be uh, uh, books that are that were written in the set that were produced in the second century. So that's why some scholars uh, suggested a revised tripod canon theory. So some scholars suggested this that the third section, the writings, the Ketuvim, was not decided at that meeting in Yavne. Instead, it reflects what had been collected in the temple archives by the year 70 CE. 70 C is a very important date because that was the time when the second temple was destroyed once again. And after that, it was no longer rebuilt. So that's why it's important that uh, that date, 70 C. Others claim that the third group, that means the writings, developed later in the second or third century, and that earlier Jewish authorities only considered the two categories, the Pentateuch, or the Torah and the prophets to be canonical. One scholar, Collins, suggested that the tripod canon only developed among one specific Jewish, Jewish sect, namely the Pharisees. So anyway, at, at this point, we don't have yet resolution uh, with regards to what theory would actually explain 
the the what you call this the dating and the formation of the canon in the old testament that's basically as far as we can go about it as in the context of the catholic church you have to realize that it was only in the first council of trend in the middle ages like the 15th century that they decided to uh base identify which books basically we considered canonical as far as the old testament is concerned so it's already like a very late time. So at this early, nothing was definite. There was no one single list that was applicable to everybody basically. So anyway, when it comes to codices, canon, and early Christians, Hebrew scriptures, the first copies were written in scrolls. And then the earliest codex version dates to the Middle Ages already. Like the earliest Bible codex form is in the fourth century Greek manuscripts. But with the, with the New Testament, we have something like in the second century. So it's, it is difficult to assess when the concept of a single authoritative canon became part of Jewish consciousness. So where they, they would really see in one, one collection, one codex, all of the books that they would, they would consider as canonical for them. Evidence would suggest that various collections like the Law, the Prophets, the Psalms, the Twelve, in one scroll, then the writings were produced over the course of six or so centuries. So the collection that they have were basically un categorized under this. Yet it is difficult to determine their contents before the evidence in rabbinical teaching in the Talmud and when or whether they came to be considered as a whole. So when was the time really? that they were considered as one whole Bible of the Old Testament. Uh, these different collections basically that we have. Since no canon list created by a second temple period author exists, to determine the above mentioned problematic would have to be deduced from fragmentary papyri and literary citations. Basically just telling us we don't have solid evidence to determine at what point when in the history this collection has been, has been considered complete or together and and which uh, document would give us basically the actual list of what is canonical for them so such lists emerge in the context of the christian debates eventually but uh, this list basically wasn't there uh, from the very beginning in the earlier time so christian consensus on the old testament canon proved elusive so there is no common uh, understanding for the following reasons, early Christians began using Jewish scriptures when there were regional and sectarian variations about the last portion of that canon. That means the writings. What constituted the other books of our ancestors in the, that was mentioned in the book of Sirach seems to have varied. So we don't know exactly what are the contents, how many are basically uh, included in what different scholars would say as a, a collection of their writings. Targumim, or Aramaic translations of scriptures, it's another resource that we have. The Targum is an Aramaic translation of the scripture. It, they, they did that while listening to the uh, text being proclaimed. So those were Aramaic-speaking people were translating them simultaneously. And then this collection of books that are translations into Aramaic of the scriptures became what is called as Targum or Targumim uh, plural. So they were developed during this time and were probably extemporaneously done during synagogue worship. Thus, there is no preferred Aramaic version. Jesus and the first Christians used some of these form of scriptures, most likely in Aramaic, which have not been preserved. We don't have copies of those at the, at the present. Scholars would disagree over whether the use by the New Testament authors of Greek scriptural materials not found in later Hebrew canon would indicate the existence of a broader canon, or simply the use of materials considered to be instructional but non-canonical, or if this is reflective of an early stage in the development of canon consciousness. We cannot determine basically those uh, realities on the basis of the use of the New Testament of script, Greek scriptural, basically that was not found in uh, Hebrew, Hebrew text. By the fourth century, Christian authorities except Jerome, which we, whose feast we celebrated yesterday, 
and his contemporary Rufinus considered the books in the earliest Septuagint codices to, to be authoritative. So you see, these are individuals. Of course, they are uh, well-known individuals in the early Christian history, but they were the ones uh, proclaiming or considering books that are authoritative. Earliest biblical manuscripts produced by Christians would include one and two Estras, Wisdom, Sirach, to Judith, Tobit, Baruch, and the letter of Jeremiah. Christians also use other writings, like should, what we have in the Shudepigrapha, Enoch, Janus and Jambes, Apocalypse of Elijah and Jubilees. They were also, con they were also considered by some Christian leaders as, as authoritative. Although not canonical, they are regarded as useful teaching and helpful also for understanding New Testament references. Because some of these materials have been used by New Testament authors as well. So anyway, I will just stop there, and then in our, tomorrow I'll just continue with the New Testament, uh, uh, what you call this, uh, canon canonical processes. So at this point, basically what uh, we have just been saying, we don't know when, when exactly this particular canon in the Old Testament have been decided upon. But these are just some of the ideas that, we, that have been brought into the discussion by different scholars here and there. But what is clear is that the, maybe the books in the Old Testament were canonized according to their different categories. Because the first ones that became important were the, were the first, first five books that we call Pentateuch, or what the, what the Jews would call the Torah. And then, of course, the prophets, they came second. And then, of course, later, the, the writings, which basically have been categorized in two different uh, ways. And the number of uh, books that are contained in this list, in the writings, are definitely different from different generations, different communities, and different individuals here and there. So I will stop here.